we're going to try something a little bit different this morning. Uh, and we're going to get into a discussion about gene therapy uh, and some of the latest results. And, and this is really very timely because we just finished the uh, International Society Thrombosis Hemostasis, ISTH meetings uh, this past week, where quite a, quite a bit of clinical data was, uh, were presented uh, for gene therapy trials, uh, both phase one, two, as well as phase three. Uh, so let's get into a discussion about that. And uh, one, way, one area to start is something that um, you and I have been talking about now for, for quite a while, uh, questions about uh, the outcomes in gene therapy clinical trials, uh, focusing specifically on the variability between patients who receive the gene therapy. Uh, so how much factor do they have on board after receiving it? Uh, the durability of the expression, how long does it last? Um, does it work? Does it prevent bleeds? And the safety implications of gene therapy, both in the short term and the, and, uh, the longer term, uh, since this is a therapy that is with one for, uh, for a very long period of time. So based on some of the data that have come out of the ISTH, um, would you like to comment on uh, variability first, and then we'll cover some durability? Sure. And uh, maybe just to update people, you know, what did we actually see at this conference? So <clears throat> we saw um, uh, results from both factor eight heme programs and uh, factor nine heme B programs. We saw results from phase one, two. We saw results from uh, some uh, updates on phase three trials. And I, I think there have been several themes that um, we can take from that. <clears throat> from a variability perspective, it seems pretty clear that uh, the variability, particularly in the factor eight programs, remains quite wide. Uh, I think easily a tenfold uh, range or more uh, in expression, even for patients who have received the same vector doses of, uh, of AV uh, gene transfer. Uh, for factor nine, I would say the variability also remains uh, pretty significant. <clears throat> what I think we're getting some clarity on though, is that over time, some of that variability seems to be narrowing. So if we look in the early sort of six months to a year after gene transfer, that where, that's where we seem to see the widest variability. And then over subsequent years, there seems to be uh, maybe a narrowing of, of that uh, variability into a range. Um, from a um, overall expression perspective, I think what we're seeing is uh, a little more consistently getting results that are in the near normal uh, to normal range from the factor nine programs. Um, for the factor eight programs over time, I think we're seeing patients who are, at least after you know, multiple years of follow-up, um, uh, majority of the individuals are in the mild range. Um, some have even dropped off the lower bounds of the curve and have uh, now had you know, expression levels that are below the level of uh, quantitation. <clears throat> From a um, comparison between the eight and nine, uh, I would say my assessment of the results from the heme B programs is that the expression seems to be pretty consistent over the long term. You know, we had updates from AMT 060, which was the, uh, the precursor uh, vector with wild type factor nine in heme B patients. And uh, this was an AV5 vector. Those patients now have been followed uh, for five years. And even though the expression level overall was in the lower range, um, the highest dose cohort, sort of in the five to 11% range, factor nine expression, that has been uh, pretty consistent now over five years. Uh, we have uh, data on the one year, 52 week expression from the phase three study from AMT 061, uh, which is the uh, same vector, but with the highly active Padua variant. So of course the expression is uh, a multiple higher, five to eight fold from the wild type. Uh, but these patients now um, through week 52, it's a large cohort, uh, 54 patients that were dosed in that phase three trial. And uh, the mean factor nine activity is uh, just over 40%. And if we look at the population of patients from about six months 
um, through now into a year, uh, really no evidence of some trailing off of the activity levels. <clears throat> I, I think you and I have shared continued concerns about what we're seeing from the HEMA programs. So uh, we saw at this uh, meeting um, two longer term follow-ups from phase one, two programs, uh, BMN 270, um, as well as the uh, SPK uh, 8011 trial, um, both HEMA programs, different vectors, BMN 270 being AV5, SPK 8011 uh, being a, um, a derivative, if you like, of an AV8 vector. And uh, we had uh, four and five year updates from that phase one, two program with BM2, uh, BM, BMN 270 and a th uh, three year update from the uh, SPK 8011 uh, program. <clears throat> my, my assessment of, of the data that's been shown is that uh, there is some uh, uh, drop in activity over time. Uh, I think the majority of the patients still seem to be sustained within the mild range. Um, however, if you continue to look at the tracking from year one to year two to year three and so on, there does seem to be a steady decline over time. Um, we can you know, make some uh, suggestions that maybe the slope of the decline may be uh, changing over time, but I've seen no observations from the trial data that's been shown so far that we have what I would call stabilized that expression. Um, and so this is, this is a curious observation why we're seeing this difference for, uh, for the factory A programs. All right, well, thanks, Steve. You've really covered the gamut here from uh... Uh, from these clinical trials. So let's get into a couple of specifics. Um, here's a tough question for you. Um, do we have any clues on how to predict which patients will do well on gene therapy and which won't? You described all of the variability uh, that we see, a tenfold variability from low to, to high. Um, how can we predict, uh, given the same dose of vector and what appears to be uh, a similar kind of a patient? Who's going to respond and who's not? You know, this is a relatively homogeneous group with regards to eligibility. Um, you know, we're looking at men 18 and up, severe, maybe to moderate severe. You know, some trials have accepted up to 2% expression levels. Um, liver health had to be, um, you know, pretty standard assessment based on, um, you know, no advanced fibrosis. They could have hepatitis history. Uh, but they had to have gone through, uh, you know, sustained viral um, uh, response to uh, anti-hepatitis C uh, therapy, uh, but not homogeneous with respect to their clinical presentations. Lots of variability in patients who were they on prophylaxis before they came into the trial? How much joint disease did they have um, before they were uh, transduced, etc.? So when we look at the outcomes, um, yes, from a I would say a transduction of the liver. Um, you, this group looks pretty similar, but from the response to that gene transduction, how much expression they have, and then what's the impact on their bleeding? I think we are seeing some homogeneous, or sorry, heterogeneous responses. Um, my guess is, is that if we were able to get liver biopsies in all these patients, we would probably see at comparable doses that the amount of transduction at the liver cells is probably pretty similar. But then you have a host of all other factors that are contributing to how much expression is actually coming out of, that, out of those cells. Um, how much protein are they able to produce? It could even go back to, you know, how well did these um, uh, transgenes form into their uh, episomal structures uh, inside the cell? How well do they access the machinery so that the genes get turned on properly, that they, the message levels get transcribed, that the protein level uh, gets secreted efficiently through the cell? So you start adding up all these variables and we start to see, we don't have any predictors for these. The, the predictors that we think about outcomes are all those clinical things that we can examine in a patient, but these are all cellular and genetic mechanisms inside a person's body that is just a black box to us. And so I would say, no, we have no prediction on who's going to get that 5% level or who's going to get that 150% level from the exact same uh, gene transfer strategy. Uh, well, well stated. And, you know, that's been a frustration of mine as well, because that black box 
there just hasn't been a lot of effort in the entire research community to figure out what's inside of it. And yet, if we did understand what was inside of it, for instance, if we examined liver biopsies and understood what was happening in the cell to the, to the transgene, to the expression of the transgene, that offers the opportunity to look for drugs to intervene, mm. to, to boost expression. Um, and some of those drugs exist and have been done in animal studies, but nothing really has made its way into clinical translation, which could provide for more homogeneity in the response. Now, wh one thing I would, would say is that I do think we're getting clarity on the correlation between expression levels and bleed protection. Uh, I, I think the trials are actually backing up a lot of the hypotheses that people had going into these trials. What kind of thresholds were we going to have to meet in order to abrogate bleeding? Yeah. And it, it seems pretty clear now that if you get even into the, the high moderate or low mild range, um, you can suppress the vast majority of spontaneous bleeding, um, particularly uh, joint bleeding. But we also know this from the way we manage patients outside of gene therapy. If you have substantial joint disease, um, you probably require even higher levels to completely abrogate breakthrough bleeding. And so I know people have looked at these trials and they said, well, we, we see patients with expression in the 25% range, 30%, and they're still reporting you know, sporadic bleeding. Well, I think that's our experience with adult patients as well who have advanced joint disease. So I don't think we should be surprised at that. I'm encouraged that we hopefully have convinced people that the outcome measure of the factor level um, is uh, probably a very good, uh, at least co-primary outcome for these studies uh, to verify uh, what the degree of protection is likely to be. Yeah, I think that's a good point, and especially about the patients who have joint damage, pre-existing joint damage. Um, they sometimes do require higher amounts of factor. Um, so to, to summarize this part, um, it's worth emphasizing that despite all of the variability, patients are winding up in the low mild to higher mild range and have substantial protection from bleeding, regardless of the variability. Um, how long that lasts, um, we're not sure. For factor eight, for factor nine, it looks like it's going to last for some substantial period of time. In our last couple of minutes, I do want to cover safety. Um, and maybe you could very briefly address the concerns about short-term safety um, and the use of uh, immunosuppressants to manage the short to intermediate response and then long-term safety. Sure. Well, I think across all the trials, it's now very clear that the primary treatment-related adverse effect um, is elevation in liver enzymes as a marker of some form of liver toxicity uh, from uh, receiving these vectors. I, I don't believe we have the whole story about what the mechanisms are that are involved in that transaminitis. Um, it's, it, if you look at the phase one, uh, two trials, almost all of those treatment-related adverse events occur within the first year. We now have up to five years of follow-up. If there are any late elevations in those liver enzymes, it looks like they're not leading to uh, the need for additional management. So those early treatment-related adverse events of elevated transaminases, those all are receiving uh, corticosteroids as per pro protocol. And the majority of the participants are able to uh, see resolution of those transaminase levels. Um, some inconsistency on whether there's any impact on the expression levels of the, of the factor, whether it's factor eight or factor nine. But for the majority of individuals, they'll go on steroids for a period of time. They'll eventually be able to wean, wean off, whether that's within the first six months or certainly within the first year. And then after that, we're not seeing really any evidence of ongoing treatment related adverse events are related to that. So in the short term, that's what we should be uh, still focusing on. We've certainly seen some infusion reactions in the first 24, 48 hours. This is pretty typical for any biologic agent infused and those have all been uh, very manageable. Long-term side effects, as you and I have talked before, as many others have, um, there's this concern about what's the impact potentially of integration events. Um, the, the AAV platform was brought first to the clinic 
uh, because we, we expected that the vast majority of the transgene elements were going to remain episomal and these circularized episomes outside of the chromosomes of the, of the cell. Mm -hmm. But we have uh, some um, biopsy data now, which has confirmed that at a rate of, you know, probably, uh, you know, uh, one to two per 10,000 cells, um, there is a degree of integration events where par portions of the transgene end up integrated into the, the DNA in that cell. Um, so what this has raised is uh, whether these, if you want to call them rare integration events, could trigger some sort of a cancerous transformation of cells. Um, so in the, in the liver, of course, this would be hepatocellular carcinoma. Well, this population already carries unique risks for this cancer already. Uh, hepatocellular carcinoma is strongly linked with prior infection with hep B and C, 80% of all cases. And the gene therapy trials have not excluded patients with a history of hep B and C. Um, they do have to go through some treatment to eradicate the hep C virus. Um, we have excluded patients with advanced fibrosis. They seem to be the highest risk um, for hepatocellular carcinoma development. Um, and that's where the liver screening comes in. But we have all accepted now that hepatocellular carcinoma risk is reduced, but not completely eliminated with hep C eradication. So uh, what transpired in uh, one of the trials, the Hope B gene therapy trial, is that there was a single participant who one year after uh, gene transfer um, had a per protocol uh, liver ultrasound and was demonstrated to have a liver mass and a biopsy determined that this was hepatocellular carcinoma. This was not present before entering the trial. He was 69 years old. He had a history of hep B and C. For, contracted more than 30 years ago, of course. He had gone through eradication, um, but he did meet uh, eligibility for the trial. Um, at the time of surgical resection to uh, uh, downstage him, a second lesion was identified. This was treated with chemoembolization. That participant's going on for discussions regarding liver transplant, but what we had opportunity um, is he had sampling at the time of surgery of both the tumor specimen and the adjacent normal tissue. And this was subjected to extensive genomic analysis. And uh, that's where we were able to show that uh, consistent with prior AV gene therapy, integration events were very low. Turned out it was at a rate of 0.027% of the liver cells. And notably, there was no dominant integration site within the hepatocellular carcinoma sample. Rather, what we saw were multiple structural chromosomal variants, um, large chromosomal rearrangements, mutations and oncogenes, all of which have been well described to occur in hepatocellular carcinoma independent of gene therapy. So this provided solid evidence that at least the hepatocellular carcinoma developed in this patient was unlikely to be related to gene therapy treatment and really attributable to the patient's underlying risk factors. But this does highlight for me sort of the challenges of gene therapy. Um, almost certainly this will not be the only case of a malignancy that happens to occur in a patient who's gone through gene transfer. And as long as we continue to enroll patients who have histories of hepatitis B and C, there may be other uh, events, maybe over multiple years, where we might see some additional hepatocellular carcinomas. I think uh, the first few events that come up probably will be subjected to this kind of genomic analysis. But if the results keep coming back, no dominant integration site, no evidence of activation of oncogenes, uh, characteristics that are typical for uh, those cancers when they occur in the absence of gene therapy, I think this will continue to bring reassurance that this platform of therapy, AAV gene transfer, is not triggering malignancies over the long term. Okay, thank you, Steve.